On the other hand, contrasting this very obvious need, we have behind us almost a decade when channels of communications were limited rather than stretched. A decade when the powerful dominant message was that either you are with us or you are against us. A language of us against them, a black and white version of the globe. I believe that such a world is a more dangerous place. A world where we are leaving more scope to prejudice and prejudgments. A world where we are inclined to draw simplistic solutions. A world where there is less scope for understanding what it takes to manage complexity, differences, and what it takes to grasp the interest and motivation that shapes positions and actions from the other side. A world where we did not really drew, draw the benefit of the universal human right of freedom of expression, because there was some kind of auto-censorship of not reaching out to the other side. As I see it, the world suffers from a serious deficit of dialogue and channels of communication. Or if you like, it suffers from less than optimal use of this universal right of the freedom of expression. The alternative to dialogue is monologue, communicating one way. It means limiting the opportunities of building bridges or reaching a minimum of common ground. You need channels of communication to be able to listen. This too, I believe, is a dimension of how we manage at the same time interdependence and freedom of expression. That is, when to talk and not to talk, when to walk and not to walk, when to confront your opponent and when to engage in dialogue. These are all key questions in international politics. Last month, I attended the Durban Review Conference in Geneva. You remember what was at stake here. The result of hard negotiations on a compromise text reflecting the fight we share against racism and discrimination. The so-called Durban II conference, eight years after the turbulent Durban I. Negotiations day and night summed up at a high-level conference. Normal procedure. And as you all know, the president of Iran decided to show up in Geneva to exercise his right to freedom of expression at that meeting from the rostrum of the United Nations. He did so in a manner that drew little support. He did so by repeating messages that, in my view, stressed antagonisms and incited hatred. While he spoke, representatives from many European states walked out. For my part, however, I chose to stay in order to use my right to freedom of speech to contradict the president and tell him outright that he was spreading the politics of fear and promoting an indiscriminate message of intolerance. I respect those who opted for walking out. That is always an option. But I question the efficiency of such a response. In particular because I believe it was exactly what the president wanted. He got the images he needed of being the one who stood up to the West that he could bring back to his election campaign. By declining to listen, do we weaken or do we strengthen the ones who speak? I ask the question because, I mean, the answer is not always obvious. It's not universal. It de depends on context. By walking out, do we add to the weight of our own message or do we leave the other triumphant? Even more serious was the decision by some states, and some of them close to me, to withdraw endorsement of the final text at the very last minute. I regret, that because European I regret that because European states got exactly what they asked for in that final text. The efforts it took to negotiate the Geneva, the Geneva Declaration should be applauded as a sign of hope that global agreement is still achievable on such key values as freedom of expression. All references in that final text were well within the scope of what is already stipulated in international conventions. All paragraphs are well within red lines. In short, the Durban Review Conference outcome document reaffirms the importance of freedom of expression in the fight against racism, racial discrimination, xenophobia and related intolerance. How can we fight it without the freedom of expression? The document imposes no restriction on freedom of expression as defined in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. 
The text confirms that rules and regulations are there in order to protect individuals, not gods or religions. And all of this was agreed by consensus. It was really, I believe, a matter for celebration. To me, however, the Durban Review Conference showed some dile dilemmas for governments on the balancing act of when to engage in dialogue and when not to do so. Let me share with you at least briefly a few important principles in this regard as I see it. First, dialogue does not mean giving up fundamental values and principles. It is often the assertions in our debate that if you engage in dialogue, you have in a way laid down your, your fundamental principles. Dialogue is not acceptance, but a deliberate attempt to promote one's own interests and values. The alternative is, as I said, all too often monologue. Engaging in a dialogue, on the other hand, signif signifies confidence in your own values and principles. And engaging in dialogue does not imply an obligation to agree. The option of walking out is always there. Second observation, dialogue means seizing the middle ground. It is easy to seize the extremes. Those flanks are rapidly captured. Then it becomes quickly with us or against us. People in their large majority, however, shy the extremes. They search for solutions in the middle ground. Effective dialogue challenges the dominance of the extremes. Third observation, and consequently, we have to support and create the arenas for dialogue both in our communities, at the local level, and internationally. We have to deal with issues around a negotiation table where differences can be explained and discussed. Dialogue through microphones is seldom successful. At home, the essential community institutions where people meet and share their experiences, dreams and aspirations from kindergartens through schools, universities, organizations and places in the civil society where people work and meet each other are key to secure dialogue and communication and a search for a common ground. My fourth point is this, the importance of including the excluded. Both internationally, for example, this new phenomenon that we all struggle to deal with, non-state groups that may represent a lot of people, but they're not included in the processes. And domestically, that is all the groups without access to communication channels, to the media, the group that lack the resources. Who are they? Freedom of expression, you can only be in favor of it, but we also need to focus on inclusiveness. How to assist everyone to have that access to available channels of communication. And fifth, my last point, and it goes without saying, the key to dialogue is, of course, freedom of expression. Full stop, no restrictions. But it amounts to an act of responsibility. Speech and images can instigate hatred. And freedom of expression has to coexist with other fundamental rights. And it's our moral map that can guide us through this.